just want to thank everybody for coming. It's not very often a new CPU architecture makes it onto the scene, and so I'm hoping that uh, if anybody, if any of you have been watching these presentations, that you're excited, to, as excited about this as I am. Um, so, without further ado, I want to introduce Ivan, who's going to tell us uh, more about the mill CPU. And good morning, all. And my thanks to Facebook for hosting us. This is one of a series of talks that different groups and organizations have hosted around the valley. Um, a couple times at Google, um, uh, universities, professional organizations, what have you. And we're very pleased that Facebook has joined the, um, our hosts. The talk is on the Mill CPU and in particular on how we do software pi uh, pipelining and how to support software pipelining given the extremely unusual characteristic and features of the mill. Um, it is one of a series of talks. The prior talks, both video and the slides, are available on our website. Um, the current talk will make reference to some of the material in the prior talks, primarily the belt and the metadata talks. I will have a few slides of summary for those of you who are unfamiliar with that material. We've got a fair number of repeat people who have been to um, uh, many, if not all, of the talks, um, and they should have no problem with it, but I'm hoping that the review material will help the rest of you um, because uh, the particular subject here makes heavy use of those facilities in the machine. The details are on the prior talks. The mill itself is a general purpose CPU. It's a commercial product. It's not a research or academic endeavor. Um, it has been running for several years in simulation. Uh, our current task is to produce an FPGA version as a proof of principle. It, we're still several years away from being able to actually produce something that you can put on a board um, as a commercial <coughs> product. But the architecture itself is done, and these talks are talking about the architecture itself. The reason for doing it is because it's got a substantial power performance advantage over existing architectures. This is not circuitry. This is not fab processes. We use the same fab as everybody else. We use the same design rules as everybody else. The advantage is in the architecture, and you're going to be seeing some of the architecture features. It's not a one-trick pony. You're seeing one trick today. As you see, there's a lot of other talks with describing some of the other tricks. Um, the talk will explain um, how we are able to do software pipelines without prologues and epilogues. And those of you, well, here is a show of hands. Who's already familiar with the concept of software pipelining and how it actually occurs in loops? Um, perhaps two-thirds of the audience uh, to say, yes, that will make my life considerably easier. If I dash past some of this for the rest of you, um, please, I do accept questions, and we'll have a question period at the end. Um, how we handle pipelines which contain loop-carried data, how we handle mixed latency operations. The mill is a statically scheduled exposed uh, pipeline machine like a VLIW, and consequently we are sensitive to the latency of operations. That's not all hidden behind a vast quantity of power-hungry hardware the way it is on an out-of-order machine. And um, how we handle nested loops. The final note is you'll see that, in fact, what we've done is, in some ways, the opposite of tail recursion elimination. We've done tail recursion induction, and you'll see how that works. However, the talk is a gross oversimplification. I'm trying to convey an intuitive understanding. Those of you who are familiar with the insides of either the compiler who's doing uh, pipeline optimizations or the hardware um, know that reality is much more complicated. Uh, please be patient with me. I'm happy to go into the intimate details for anybody who wants it, but probably offline because it's rapidly going to get folks lost. 
And this is in part due to the fact that pipelining is one of the most intellectually difficult parts of the inside of a compiler and the inside of hardware because a very large number of different things apparently unrelated to each other are all happening all at once and it all has to dovetail and mesh perfectly in order for the optimization to work. So what's a pipeline? Simple example. If that's our loop body, and I'm going to ignore the control variable update and test because if I actually try and put those on the slides, nothing fits in the slides and it's even more incomprehensible. So we're only going to look at the body, and the body here is as simple as it comes. It's load a value, add a, a constant to it, and store the value. Now, if we assume that all ops are one cycle, and we do this one at a time, the time per iteration is three cycles. And it will execute something like this. A value will be loaded from memory, the result of the load will be dropped into a register, we'll, that will be copied into the adder, the adder will in turn uh, do its thing and um, will write back the result of the add. That in turn will go to a store unit. Um, the graphics that you'll see, you're seeing on this slide here are in fact the graphics that will be used throughout the talk. Um, so um, the goal here is to animate the actual data flow so that you can have a sense of what's going on um, simultaneously. And of course, it simply gets repeated and repeated and repeated um, iteration by iteration until finally we run out of slide. The subscripts on each one of the operations indicate the iteration number, the value of i that it would be. You'll see different operations executing the same cycle with different subscripts. And in each case, those subscripts are uh, correspond to the value of i or the number of iterations since we started everything. Now, what's under the hood, there's actually a load unit, a functional unit in the hardware. And when we do the load operation, the load unit fires and does its thing, and then it waits because there isn't anything else for it to do. Till we get to the next ad, whereupon it fires, and then it idles for a while, and so forth. Furthermore, the, exactly the same thing is happening with the adder. and with the store unit. This is woefully inefficient. The functional units are idle two thirds of the time. So, what we do is we run the units in parallel every cycle working on different iterations. We start off with the load and the following cycle each of the little arrow, upward pointing arrows there is a machine cycle. The following cycle, we do a load for, the, for iteration one while we're doing the add for iteration zero. The cycle after that, we do the load for iteration two, the add for iteration one, and store the result of the add, which belonged to iteration zero. So that we're spreading different iterations across the machine cycles. In order for this to work, you have to have quite a few different functional units. In particular, in this case, we had to have a load unit, a store unit, and an add unit. Um, and you have to be able to issue multiple operations in a cycle, which is called wide issue. And an example of these are superscalers, VLIWs, or the mill. The amount of parallelism that's available is determined by the, or is limited by the number of functional units you have. Um, current uh, superscalers seem to max out at eight uh, hardware pipelines or eight hardware um, uh, concurrent issues. Um, the VLIW is similar, although sometimes a bit more. The mill is an exceptionally wide issue machine, it can issue 30 or more different operations, so, um, not 
SIMD, that is, um, uh, not vector oper uh, not uh, scattered across vectors, but completely independent operations um, in a single cycle to 30 or more functional units. How all of that works is covered in the other talks, and we, and we can, won't get in here. Take my word for it for the moment. So, as you see, that particular set of operations, while they're in different cycles, correspond to a single iteration. One iteration spread over three cycles. A, that set of operations is the steady state of the pipeline. We simply repeat that, ex that instruction with those three operations over and over and over again, so long as the pipeline is running. In steady state, each executes a third of each of three iterations in this example, or a fifth of each of five, or whatever it is involved, so as to keep all of the functional units busy. Of course, this example only uses an add. If you also have a multiply functional unit, it's, it's sitting there doing nothing anyway. So you can only pipeline into the functional units that are actually called for by the loop. Time per iteration one cycle rather than three cycles. But we have to keep track of the data as well as issuing the instructions. The data produced in a given iteration must be passed to the consuming operation of the corresponding iteration. It must not be passed to the operation of a different iteration so that the iteration stay the same, tied together by data flow while it's doing it. On a conventional machine, that data gets passed via registers, and it will look kind of like this. The initial load will be loaded to a register. The following cycle, that loaded value will wind up being passed to the adder, and now in parallel, there's now two results. The second round of the load, that is the load for iteration one, gets stored into the load to its destination register, and the add goes to a different register. We'll then repeat. I'm omitting here the passage from memory up to the load and from the store down to memory because the screen gets much too clus cluttered. <coughs> Um, they will actually will show that in some of the slides, but just remember that when the load unit fires, it's actually been to memory, and when the store unit fires, it's actually going to memory. So that's how it works with just a single, um, a, a simple example, and a couple of registers, and pipelining on a conventional machine. Those of you who are already familiar with how this works could have done that uh, uh, this portion of the talk already. However, life gets more complicated if you have, if you change it so that a value gets used over multiple iterations. Back up here, we're loading one value, we're adding three to it, so, it's, so A sub I is only used once. The actual execution of this loop will, I, will wind up A sub I gets used twice, once in one iteration and once in another iteration. That, calls, that is called a loop carried variable, and the number of iterations that a value has to be carried over is called the distance of that value, and the maximal um, loop carried distance is the distance for the whole loop, uh, in terminology that will crop up by, later. So, if we attempt to um, use our, the pipeline code we did before, what happens? Well, we load, we load it into a register, and we're now to our second instruction. Whoops, we don't have the second value for the add. So that's not going to work. So what happens if we use two, upper, or two loads to get everything started up? Well, we've got a load. And in the next cycle, we load again. And no. So we could not use a single register because we've got two values to keep. And what we need is to add an extra register to ordinary, in order to hold those values. So our first load, 
Our second load goes to the second register. I was a little too fast on the button there. And now the ad is getting two arguments reflecting the load sub zero and load sub one. And we will continue and this effect is stable. However, that load, load sub two, went there. Whereas that load, load sub three, went there. But in the steady state, those two loads are the same operation, the same instruction being repeated over and over again. So how can they have different result registers in the instruction? Well, they can't. So all you can do is you can duplicate the code. You actually need two different load instructions. But this means that you're going to need two different um, everything instructions, one that uses one the registers one way and one uses the registers another way. And the way you get that those extra instructions is you unroll the loop. The not, you unroll it by a factor of the distance of the loop. This approach was first published by Monica Lamb in the early 80s. Um, it was, was at the times actually already fairly well known in industry, but she was the first to publish it. She has the same problem that happens to me all the time. I will come up with this great idea, and I'll be pleased as can be in order to discover it's already well known to everybody except me. And I believe that happened to her as well. In any case, we need two instructions, one to one register and one to the other. So it'll work like this. The first instru uh, uh, instruction goes there. The second instruction goes there. Now we're back to using the first register and then alternately going to the second register. and so forth. So, those operations use reg one. Those use reg two. The loop is unrolled 2x. It requires two instructions to implement, not just one. And the steady state is that. And here's where it goes off the rails. If what you have is a very simple loop, this is a simple loop, and you, the distance is not too large, this mechanism works. The kind of code that it works for is the kind of code you find in Livermore Loops, where pipelining is a wonderful thing. But now imagine that instead of having a, a distance of one, we change the loop distance from one to 10. Well, now we have to unroll 10x. And suddenly our loop body, the code in the loop body, has gotten much, much, much bigger. And larger, larger loops wind up running out of cache or thrashing in the cache. And your performance has just totally disappeared. A unrolled pipeline can actually be slower than the unpipelined code because of cache effects. It's an alternative. Rather than unrolling, as described, you can use a copy. You introduce a copy step. Load works as normal. The loaded value goes to the copy, and the copy goes to the second register. So the load in every case is going to reg one and the copy of the previous value is going to reg two. 
so that we are in every case, the ad is receiving both the copy um, and the um, previous value and, and the newly loaded value. This works. That is our steady state. It's only one instruction. No longer do we have a cache problem. And it, was, it would also be only one instruction, even if the distance was 10, not just one. But there's a drawback. We need one copy operation and one register for every loop carry, carried variable for every step of the distance. That actually can be a fair amount. In particular, you can wind up with a, um, uh, because it's, there's a product involved there, the number of registers and copies required increases as to the square and things can get rather hairy. I'm going to show you how we do it on the mill. In order to do that, I have to explain a little bit about the bell. Um, show of hands, who's seen enough of our talks before that you know what the bell is? About half of the audience. Thank you. We appreciate your, your uh, attention. The, belt has no, the mill has no general registers. Instead, for temporary data, it uses a FIFO data structure, which is called the belt. The belt works like a conveyor belt. A functional unit can read any position, like that. But you don't specify a destination for the ad. The new results are always dropped at the front of the FIFO, which pushes the belt along and the last value gets pushed off the end. You can have a bunch of functional units. They all can, can pull from any location on the belt. And if you have more than one a functional unit retiring a value, they all drop together onto the front of the belt. So, going back to our early example where we're just adding three, we have our load operation. The load does not drop to a register, it drops onto the belt. The following cycle, the argument goes up to the adder. And now both the load and the add drop to the belt, pushing the belt along. The following cycle, the load and the add result go to the respective functional units. The store will send the added value to, to uh, memory, and we have another pair of values for the belt. This is our steady state, and it will simply repeat. As you can see, the values which are no longer of use have been pushed off the end. Our steady state is one instruction. Now what happens if we have a loop carry variable? Again, the belt. Load of value. Load a second value. And drop it to the belt. We pass the two values to the adder. Two values drop. Now here we're shifting. 
the add gets not the two adjacent values, but the first item on the belt and the third item on the belt, that is load two and load one. The store got the first item, I uh, got the second item on the belt, which is the add. This is now stable and will repeat. Two more values go down. Next in execution. And I think you see that we're in a steady state and it will repeat. <coughs> One instruction, without any unrolling, no copies, one instruction. This is true whether we have only a distance of one, as in this little example. A distance of 10 would work exactly the same way. Um, you're just picking out whichever is the appropriate value coming off of the belt. Now, there is our steady state. And the stuff that gets you into the steady state is called a prologue. It is, and this as shown so far, is very ad hoc. The number of instructions that are required in order to produce the prologue is the unpipelined latency. If you just did the thing as an ordinary straight line code, how many cycles would it take to do? Plus the loop distance, minus one. In this particular case, the unpipelined latency is three cycles, the loop distance is zero, and so it takes two instructions in order to set up the prologue, and indeed it does. The number of operations in the prologue well, if you think about it, you're looking at the upper uh, triangular uh, submatrix of a uh, matrix, and the number of elements in that upper triangular is n times n minus 1 over 2 of the number of operations in the steady state, where n is the number in the steady state. In this case, n is 3, so n times n minus 1 over 2 is 3, and it takes three operations in order to execute the prologue. So with three ops, it took us two instructions and three ops. If, on the other hand, we had six ops, which in fact we would have had if we'd been updating the control variables and doing the branches and everything else required um, for the, to actually do this loop as opposed to just treating the body, it would take six instructions and 15 operations. Now, if there were 20 in there, it would have taken 20 instructions to get the loop started and 190 operations, which by this point we're pretty thoroughly plugging up the cache and the instruction bandwidth, all for the prologue. This, the fact that the prologue size increases as to the square of the complexity of the loop body is why you can only use software pipelining on a conventional machine for small, short, simple loops. Anything complicated and the explosion in the prologue and at the epilogue, which is where at the other end of the loop where you unwind everything and restore back out of the loop, um, basically just kills you. So, the mill has a way of handling that. Let me introduce the retire operation. The retire uh, operation's function is to supply values that the loop is not yet calculated, those which are, would have been calculated in the, the prologue but have not yet been. So if I say retire four, it is telling the hardware that four result operations are exposed to retire in this cycle. Whether they actually do is a different question, you'll see. If fewer retire, the retire operation invents results to retire. These are not meaningful, but they do have belt impact. We mark the invented operation, the operands, with a special mark that the hardware knows, which tells the hardware that the invented value is what we call a none. 
and let me explain a bit about how nuns work. Every data element inside the core has an attached extra bit. A byte, a, a, a one byte value is actually nine bits, eight bytes of payload and one extra bit, which is called the NAR bit or the not, standing for not a result. It's bit, this bit is used to flag values that have been computed, which are in fact erroneous. The hardware has detected a problem, and rather than throwing a fault, because we might be in speculated code that is not actually part of the program, or will not actually be a part of the program, um, it merely marks the data as bogus, and only later when we discover that it really was part of the program uh, that do we actually throw a fault. You'll see. So if I have an operation that works okay, you'll get a perfectly ordinary data value with the NARBIT clear. If the operation detects that there was a problem, it produces a NAR value with the NARBIT set, and instead of having a value in, uh, attached to the thing, it carries a payload, and the payload information contains a kind, an indication of a kind of error or that produced the problem, and some bits which describe where the problem was originally detected, which are used by the debugger in order to report a, the, detection, uh, the uh, point at which the fault was originally detected. Now, we need to distinguish whether data is an error or just missing. And a none is a kind of NAR, it has an NAR bit set, but the kind value says that this is not actually an error. This is just data that isn't here. And most operations are speculable. Things like adds and multiplies and so forth. Um, do, uh, you can speculate through them. They have no side effects. They produce a result and that's all they do. NARs and nuns pass through speculable operations unchanged. If I have a valid data value and a speculable operation, and I pass the valid value as an argument to the operation, the result will itself also be valid unless the operation itself detects an error. And similarly, if I have a NAR value, which is passed as an argument to a speculable operation, it passes through and the very same NAR is produced as a result so that we still have the payload that says what was the original kind and the original source of error, despite the fact it's been passed through an add or a multiply or something subsequently. Nuns work the same way. They pass through and wind up being, uh, becoming part of the result. Non-speculable operations are those with side effects. The most common example of this is a store to memory, where the side effect is, in fact, writing to memory. Normal data, NARs and NUNs, differ in how they respond to non-speculable operations. They're the same for speculable, but different in this case. A normal data value passed to a non-speculable operation produces a normal result and is all its side effects. A NAR passed to a non-speculable operation throws a fault. A NUN passed to a non-speculable operation is simply discarded. There are no side effects. The side effects are suppressed. Nothing happens using nuns. First, fill the belt with nuns. Now execute the steady state instruction, the whole thing. Note that the only valid operation in this thing is the load, because that is the very first operation and belongs to iteration zero. The add and the store belong to iterations which are before the first operation, out there in Never Never Land. These are not operations which should actually have any consequences seen by the program. And in fact, they're omitted in the conventional prologue. We still have them here. But, so we will supply data from the belt, passing it to, to the add, and we will supply data to the store, just as we were, as if we were in the steady state. But, because we preloaded the belt with nuns, the values that get supplied to the add and the store are nuns. We now advance the belt, 
This is just our normal steady state. We'll retire the results of our computation. We get the load perfectly ordinarily. The add is going to retire a result, but the add had a none as an argument, which means the add is going to produce a none as a result. Nuns flow through speculable operations like adds. The store, also getting a none, is a non-speculable operation. It has side effects, but because it's working on a nun, we do not go to memory. Nothing happens. It's been eaten. Repeat the process. We're now at load one, add zero, and store minus one. The add now has a, value argu a valid argument, but the store is suppressed because it got a none. And we're now in our steady state. And now we go to memory because the store had a non-none argument that can be stored normally. Note that what we've been using for the prologue is in fact there are perfectly ordinary steady state single instruction. But by the fact that we've preloaded everything with nuns, no prologue code is required at all. The steady state loop body is the prologue on the mill. Now, so far, all of the example operations have executed in one cycle for purposes of discussion. But how about operations that take longer? That add there is a one cycle add. Let's change it to a multiply. And we'll assume that a multiply takes three cycles. The ordinary code is going to work like that. If this was open code, not in loop, we'd have to have no ops in order to wait for the multiply before we can do the store. Would the previous code work? Initialize the belt. Pull up the two values. Retire the load. So far, so good. Notice that the multiply did not drop a result. That's because the multiply takes three cycles. We just started a multiply, and the multiplier is busily hard at work, and two cycles from now, three cycles in all, there will be a result, but there's no result in this cycle. The, the following cycle, again, now the multiply gets a valid argument, but again, it doesn't have a result available, nor did the earlier multiply have a result available. But we're still okay. We still have suppressed the store. Whoops, we didn't store the result of a multiply. We stored one of our loaded values. So I had the simple-minded code that we had before is not going to work. So we introduce the retire operation. The retire operation forces a drop count of the cycle by dropping nuns if necessary. In our steady state, we're going to be dropping two values, one from the load and one from the multiply. So we want to say retire of two and the retire operation will guarantee that we get two values dropped, inventing a value if necessary. Our belt. The arguments go up. The load value is dropped, but there's only one value coming from actual execution. So a second value is invented by the retire, and it drops a none. Store is suppressed. A 
again, the loaded value. The multiply still hasn't gotten anything done yet. So the retire fills in and supplies the value. There's the load, but we're actually going to be getting a value out of that first multiply. That multiply minus one, all the way to the left there that we started three cycles ago. But its argument was in fact a none, which means it's going to produce a none. So that's where that none came from. It did not come from the retire like in the two previous cycles. It came from the multiply, but the multiply producing a none anyway because it's actually its input was also a none. And now, at long last, a real multiply result. We're still suppressing the store. store this time actually had a real value, not a none. It went to memory, and we're in a steady state. From now on, we will be firing a real load, a real multiply, and a real store, and sending a value to memory every single cycle. It took one trip through the loop, that is the whole loop latency, to reach this steady state for executions of the loop body instruction um, because it takes four cycles to do the entire loop. But thereafter, it's one full iteration per cycle. The amount of instruction level parallelism is limited only by the amount of um, the complexity of the loop body and by the hardware compute capacity. If your loop body needs five adds in order to turn it into one instruction, you have to have five adders. Well, in fact, some mills, the mill is a family of diff differing capacity. Some of the higher end uh, mills, uh, the mill gold has got eight ALUs that can be firing a different ad um, uh, uh, simultaneously every cycle. Um, so if your loop needs five, and it'll run on a mill gold in one cycle. Um, on something like a mill tin, which has only got one ALU, it's not going to run in one cycle because you have you need five ads to do. It'll take five cycles to do it. Now, that only works if there's enough room on the belt. The belt has got a fixed size, which is set suitable for common usage. If there are too many loop carry variables, well, something will fall off the end before you have a chance to use it. The excess belt data that will be needed later can be spilled to what's called the scratch pad, which is a special hardware buffer. A spill operation can take any value off the belt and drop it down to a location at the scratch pad. The corresponding fill operation will take any value out of the scratch pad, put it up into the belt, and of course push the belt along, dropping a value off. This is just another operation that can be mixed in with everything else. The scratch pad is frame local. It's actually a, a smoke and mirrors, but the, uh, from the programming model, what actually appears to be happening is that each function gets a completely new scratch pad for its private use. It has a fixed max size. You have to explicitly allocate portions out of it, which is how, uh, how we support the smoke and mirrors. Um, it is not memory. You, there are no pointers, there's no indexing, it uses static byte addressing. It's purely a place where you can park values for a period of time. And there's a three cycle spill to fill latency. I push a value now, I can get it back three cycles later. The belt is sized that, you, that uh, the belt will hold three cycles worth of data. Every time you do an allocation, you get a new portion of scratch pad available to spill and fill. So if we start off with an empty scratch pad, there's a base to indicate the, the, uh, our current allocation point, and a fence that tells us there isn't anything allocated. The scratch F operation, which is the scratch allocating operation, will advance the fence and 
allocate that portion of scratch pad which is now available for spill and fill. If subsequently we do another allocation, the fence gets advanced again. There's a hard upper limit and the compiler better not ask for more than there has. Each allocation has a corresponding rotator in hardware. A rotator is associated with a loop. If there are two allocations, these will be associated with an outer loop and an inner loop. So we have the outer rotator and the inner rotator. The eldest allocation is the outermost and the youngest allocation is the innermost. A rotator is a circular address-free mapper. It maintains a cursor and um, addresses coming from spill and fill are biased by the amount of the cursor with wrap around so that in effect it acts like the rotating registers in the itanium except that scratch patterns not registers and there are a number of differences but um, that, for that information you'll go to another talk or you can ask if you like. The addresses are biased with wrap around before conversion to a physical address there's a rotate operation which advances the cursor with wraparound. So if I say rotate 20 and I, my uh, cursor is less than 20 from the end, then I'll go to the end and continue advancing as necessary. So uh, logically, the whole thing is a, um, acts like a circular uh, shift of the scratch pad area, although it's all done in the addressing, not actually moving data. And this, of course, is how the itanium rotating registers work. They don't actually move any registers. They just cha um, change the, the register number mapping. Um, and this is essentially the same mechanism, but applied to uh, the, uh, these rotators. The itanium only has one set of registers. Um, you can have uh, many rotators on the mill. This gives you the effect of belt-like renaming to the, the portion of the scratch pad governed by the rotator so that when we run out of a normal belt um, and need to save loop carry variables, we can drop them down onto um, the innermost rotator and then um, ha act, have it act like the belt had advanced by doing the rotate operation at the bottom of our loop or included in, in our uh, steady state operation and things will advance appropriately. Now, how do you get a inner allocator and how is this associated? The inner operation is used on the mill because the mill treats a loop body, actually the entirety of a loop including its, its predicate and control, as if it were a function. The inner operation starts a new nested loop. It takes arguments just like a call. This says Start me a new loop with two arguments, which were position five and position three on the belt. You get an empty belt initialized with those two values. Typically, the arguments are initial values used for the control variables. It does not change the stack frame or your protection environment. <clears throat> Operations which are in flight in a multiplier, for example, at inner are completed after the loop exit. Leave is the corresponding to the return, it, or break it in, in, uh, in an actual loop. Um, it takes arguments, just like a return does. And these arguments are typically uh, return values for searches or something like that. It restores the belt to the state when the corresponding inner was executed and drops the leave arguments at the front. Any computation which was in flight in the now exited loop body is thrown away. The multiplier may in fact be working on something, but all of that gets suppressed so that, and discarded. In this, it is sim also similar to like the return operation on the mill. Mill call behavior is covered in a different talk. And it discards the innermost rotator if one was allocated in the course of the loop. 
So, how loop vectors works. Say this is our um, belt at the time when uh, we're in our outer loop and we want to enter an inner loop. Well, we execute the inner operation and head there is the code which is at the start of the loop, the, inner, the new inner loop, and b1, b5, b3, b3 are the arguments intended for that inner loop. The horizontal dotted line there indicates a cycle boundary. So once enter is executed, we're now in the inner loop, and it has a belt of its own, which starts out empty, nothing in it, except that it is initialized with the arguments to the inner operation. In this, it works exactly like called and uses the same hardware. Um, then that executes for some number of times. Um, at the end of the loop, when we're do a leave, let's say the belt is turned into this computed something and that's the, the residue on the belt and we do a leave saying hey return this value because this is the value I searched for for example and when we're now a cycle later we're back in the outer loop the belt of the outer loop has been restored and the value that was the argument to leave is now dumped on the front. In effect, the whole inner loop is an atomic operation, like an add in the viewpoint of the outer loop. This makes inner and outer loops vastly easier to compile. I'm speaking as a compiler writer who has struggled with um, uh, how to uh, properly nested pipelines. It's difficult. It has those same effects. It can drop multiple results. This example only re uh, drops one. Uh, yeah. So does the does the inner operation terminate the EBB for the outer block or or not? Right? Does inner if you're emphasizing the sort of analogy with call? You here. can access the data of the outer block because those are still on the scratch pad and still accessible to you, but they, you cannot rotate that data. The rotate operation applies to the inner, um, to the inner loop entirely. This is actually just an instruction encoding question. Does, does, uh, does the leave instruction return, or does, it, um, or does it sort of continue execution somewhere in the middle of the outer EBP? Oh, it can be, uh, oh, can, can you leave on uh, multiple levels? That oh, that, that might be an even more interesting question. I, I, I just meant does, uh, you know, does, so you're, you're running along merrily, there's some loop, right? There's code before the loop, code after the loop. Is the code before and after the loop end up getting compiled as an EBB or uh, that, that has a sort of little detour into this inner thing, the same way it would have a detour into a call if it called a routine? Or are they two different EBBs? Essentially, essentially, what the compiler's task is, is to treat it just like a call. The loop body is made into a hunk of code the way a function is made into a hunk of code, and the inner and leave operations correspond to call and return, and the compiler's job is essentially the same. The difference between inner and call is that you have not executed the stack frame, and you don't get a new stack frame. The inner loop still has access to the function's local variables. Um, it also has access to the variables of the next outer uh, to enclosing loops. Um, uh, and once you leave, now you're in an enclosing loop, and now you're rotating that one as, um, if you do a rotate operation. Thank you. We have to save and restore that, the belt in order to make that work. That's done by a spiller, which is a background engine. Um, belt access is always to the values of the current belt, not to the saved one. If you change the, belt, the um, associated belt ID, um, then this, the, the, that belt is no longer accessible. You now have a new belt, or so it appears. Uh, but uh, the old data is still there. It can be spilled at leisure. The spiller runs in the background. Um, values passed to the belt are passed by copy. If I have a value which is being computed, a 
in a long running operation like a multiply. I can start the multiply. A cycle later we're still in the multiply and if we now enter a new loop, we're now in the inner loop and our multiply is ready to complete. Well, we could retire the result of the multiply in to the belt that we're in in, uh, in the inner loop, but the multiply actually it belongs to the outer loop. Um, and the result of that multiply should not, in fact, be dropped into the middle of what the inner loop is trying to do. So we don't want to do that. Instead, what happens is the multiply completes and its result is saved temporarily in the spiller while we run the entire inner loop. And only when we come back from the inner loop and we're back in the outer loop does that value retire just as if the inner loop had not executed at all. This again it works exactly the same way as a values being live across a call and return pair um, so as to make a call and return appear transparently an atomic operation like an ad, inner and leave wind up being a transparent atomic operation. Loops are atomic. In flights retire after the loops exit. And that's it except for a brief summary and some questions. We can pipeline essentially any loop. This includes there being embedded calls or control flow. Um, there are some niceties involved in that which we have not have, uh, cannot explain in slides and within the time limit. No prologue is needed. The steady state loop body is used as a prologue. The loop is treated like a function from its pipeline and nested loops at all levels. You can have an unlimited loop distance. Nearer data is kept on the belt. Far data is kept on the scratch pad. You can have un un unlimited number of loop carried variables. It is still worth pipelining everything, unlike on a conventional machine. There's no unrolling and no copies. The loop exit automatically cleans up, including any in-flight computation in the now exited loop. And the inner and leave operations support modularity. The loops get arguments and return results like a function. I meant the way back at the beginning, I mentioned that what we essentially have here is the dual of tail recursion elimination. We have converted loops back into functions as a practical matter. I want to give one piece of credit here. The retire operation that got explained was something to do what it does, was something that I wrestled with for five years or longer trying to figure out how to pipeline um, uh, statically scheduled loops where um, the operands could have a long time before they, before they would uh, eventually drop a result. Dave Yost here in the audience invented the retire operation and in fact internally we have always called that, that invention Dave's device. Um, it is um, <laughs> the face that you just saw. Um, one of the reasons why it took 10 years to produce the Mills design, we have been at this for a long time, is because we frequently there were problems we knew, we knew what we wanted to do, and we couldn't figure it out, we couldn't figure it out, we couldn't figure it out. And then finally the burst of insight happens, and bursts of insight cannot be scheduled. They happen when they happen, and you just have to wait. And we've waited 10 years, and with the middle that you're seeing, and what was present in the other talks reflects that. And um, this pipelining is one of the major reasons why the mill has such an, a strong performance advantage over a conventional machine. 
70 to 80 percent of operations executed by ordinary general purpose code are in loops. And for BLAST type code, um, linear algebra type code, the Livermore loops type of code, Fortran can do incredible power performance because they can pipeline the kind of loops you see in Fortran. General purpose loops don't work like that. They're bigger, they contain control flow, um, and uh, they have massive quantities of loop carry variables that are not simple things like just an array index with a different index. And the uh, result is that a conventional machine cannot pipeline those. And the result is that you do things one at a time, one by one by one, and they go back and do it again one by one by one. With this, we are able to make use of the full width of the mill machine as I said, 30 or more ops on some family members. We've got benchmarks. Uh, uh, I was looking at one just yesterday. The eight queens, standard classic benchmark, the inner loop of that, which is looking, searching the, uh, the chessboard table to see if you can place a queen. The inner loop for that is one instruction with 23 operations. Look at uh, run eight queens on any other machine and see how long the inner loop takes. You'll see. In any case, thank you, and I'm open for questions. Oh, uh, b one moment. We, we need a shameless plug. Um, you can get technical information um, on our website in the do uh, uh, slash docs. And if you'd like notification of announcements for other presentations or uh, availability of things like white papers and what have you, there's a mailing list. And um, those of you who are interested in the mill as a company can sign up on the investor list. Um, feel free. Open to questions. When you have lambda functions, they share outer scope and inner scope. Do you imagine using inner and leave to support compiling lambda functions? You, for statically nested functions, no, you would not want to do that. We support statically nested functions in a different way. Um, the, the major reason being that, uh, that um, you do want the inner function to actually have stack residence. Um, it, it has uh, got genuine local variables and needs to be able to build pointers to those local variables and pass those pointers into a global data structure. But bad program, though that may be, nonetheless, the, the C language and other languages support that. So the, a nested function needs to be able to actually have its own private data space, which means a stack frame. The inner here is using the stack frame of the contained function, um, and it, all it's doing is, is providing an environment for its transient local values, which are being computed on the fly in the, in the course of it. You don't actually, if your loop body contains a declaration, that declaration is not for the whole loop. That's for that one iteration, and that will go on a stack frame like anybody else. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, please. Yeah, actually, I'm a PhD intern here. And before I start my PhD, I was a compiler engineer who did a, I made a compiler for a very similar architecture like MIL, which was a very large issue VLIW-like processor, 16 width or something. And we had our separate register files to handle that and based on software pipelining. And actually, the biggest problem we had was because of the long recurrent cycles in general purpose programs, we couldn't find enough instruction level parallelism across multiple loop iterations. So we didn't try queen benchmark, but we tried spec, and it was really hard to find enough parallelism. So have you ever tried more general programs? And yeah, if you could find something interesting or your IPC numbers, can you please share it with us? Okay, um, I'm a compiler person. Um, the classic argument against VLIWs is that there's only a instruction level parallelism of two in typical code. If you would take in our execution talk, you'll discover that 
for us that turns into an instruction level parallelism of six rather than two, and but is still typical of open coat. The reason why we go very, very wide is precisely because of loop pipelining. We, in general, if you can, in fact, um, do modular scheduling or something equivalent to modular scheduling. We do not, in fact, use modular scheduling, but that would take us wide a field to explain what it is we do do. Um, the, uh, in a pipeline, the available instruction level parallelism is arbitrarily large. If, again, uh, you cannot be, uh, you cannot have more of a particular kind of operation than you have functional units to do it. If you've got eight, uh, eight adds and five adders, you cannot, uh, it's going to take a minimum of two cycles no matter what you do. But on the other hand, if I've got eight adders and two adds, I can unroll my loop by a factor of four and run four iterations at once in parallel in, in my ILP. So while there, while there will always be a limit to the degree of parallelism available in pipelining, if you are able to handle the things which stop most pipelining, which is uh, you run out of registers, um, that you run out of functional units, we are wide, we don't have registers, um, or you hit things like control flow, uh, which do not a uh, pipeline because they don't overlap cleanly, um, uh, uh, then on a conventional machine, you don't get anywhere. And uh, you throw up your hands and don't pipeline the thing. Um, that's not true in the mill. We can handle arbitrary control flow, and we're very, very wide, so um, we will eventually run out of functional units, but not uh, nowhere near as soon as a machine like OA um, a Haswell with, with effectively uh, two ALUs when we've got eight. Um, uh, and we don't run out of registers because uh, we've got the belt and with the ability to have rotators in the scratch pad, the, uh, the belt is effectively extended so we don't, uh, we don't run, wind up running out. Now, the Itanium, the Itanium design was based uh, very much in the same philosophical principle as the mill is with respect to pipelining. The reason why those rotating registers are in there is to support pipelining. There's no other reason for it. And, um, well, th something of a tragedy. Uh, the, the Itanium uh, was Bob Rao's design, and he died before he had a chance to do it right. Um, his original uh, efforts wound up being taken over by commercial, for commercial reasons and changed into a machine that was rather th different than what he had originally intended. And the result is the Itanium. And it does, while it was his machine, it, in many ways it did not reflect his vision. Um, the details are irrelevant. But um, the Itanium if he'd had a chance in 10 years to work on it, the, what we now call the Itanium might have become the mill. Um, whether he would ever have come up with the idea of the belt as opposed to the rotating registers, I don't know. Um, there's, there are many fundamental differences in the concepts. But um, if anybody might have, it would be uh, Bob Rao and 15 years ago. Uh, but it, it didn't happen. Uh, with the rotating registers, you can do a pretty good job of pipelining the innermost loop. But you don't have the capability of splitting those registers into multiple nested sets the way you can on a mill. So that effectively, your pipelining on the Itanium, you'll get a pipeline in the inner loop and the outer loop will be unpipelined. On the mill, that's not true. We pipeline, 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 pipeline uh, um, as deep as we have rotators to do it with. Does that answer your question? Yeah, actually, my question is more about data dependencies. So in some cases, if you have data dependencies, even if the processor has an infinite number of registers or infinite number of functional units, you cannot run more than n number of instructions at the same time. But 
I don't know, maybe I can read your white papers or some others because there's another question. Well, I'm not sure I have, I'm not sure that I had, uh, still, I'm, I'm slightly deaf and I, I don't always get on all of the question. Um, the, the mill is a family. The extreme low end is roughly the equivalent of a desktop um, uh, power, uh, PC um, x86. Uh, the high end is substantially more than uh, the high end of any other kind of chip. Um, and you pick the family member to suit your application. If you're doing high performance computation in, in a supercomputer, you want our high end, and yes, your um, uh, your your graph or, or weather program or whatever it is you're doing can soak up every one of those functional units. Because, um, they're just massive quantities of, uh, of data level parallelism available. On the low end, if all you're doing is is um, a laptop or a, or a desktop, our low end is fine, and you'll get the same performance that you get out of an x86, and and about oh, maybe 15% of the power. Watch, watch the other talks, and then let us know what you think. Okay. Uh, so I also had, I had a bunch of deja vu moments here, also as someone who worked on a few compilers for Itanians, and especially with software pipelining. And I share the same concerns as Taiwook raised, that I think the problem is not really how you can make have a bunch of functional units is how you find parallelism, even with Vitania with like six issue. And uh, so I'm curious about what applications you're really looking at. And it looks like the advantages compared to Vitania here are basically the ability to parallelize outer loops. But my experience is that once you get to that and to get good benefits from parallelization, you better express that as thread level parallelism and not start doing that inside the single processor. And I'm guessing Mio is in order just like a tenu and you're gonna hit other issues and you start doing very aggressive predication in order to expose, to find the parallelism inside with control flow. And that just doesn't pan out. And my experience is that you better express that and, and really paralyze this at the thread level and not inside a single CPU. The conventional wisdom is that there's not enough pipe, uh, parallelism. Uh, that conventional wisdom is wrong. Um, I, I agree, and my point is just that you better express that as thread level parallelism when, you, when there is. Because it looks like the applications that you mentioned that you can find are going to be like what we call like scientific applications where you're just processing a bunch of, of arrays stuff and yes, you're gonna enroll loops and do lots of aggressive stuff to express parallelism that you could extract with other means using OpenMP or automatic parallelization or whatever. Well, the availability of ILP, of instruction level <coughs> parallelism, is a general problem not exclusive to loops. In fact, it's much worse in open code because in loops, at least, I, I, you can pipeline it and, and, and overlap the uh, uh, parallelisms from, from multiple iterations. But um, to, even in open code, um, I refer you to our talk, which is called Execution, that explains how we are able to triple the amount of instruction level parallelism. We, that's a, a, an, another hour's talk, and I would uh, uh, urge you to, to listen to it. You'll see. Um, it is true that um, uh, one of the things that you need to be able to do in order to obtain the necessary parallelism is you need to be able to eliminate all the things that prevent it. And one of the major things that prevents it is control flow. And um, the very first thing you do for a mill is you run through an if-convert everything you possibly can. And because the mill is designed for, to support massive speculation, you can if-convert things and you, it is, you do not run the risks of hazards that you do on a conventional machine, which means that we can if-convert things which are potentially would fault and that cannot normally be done on a conventional machine but we're getting well out of this subject and I need a whiteboard or uh, for you to yeah. see the slides. Yeah, it can, uh, be, it, it can my, be done. 
Well, but yeah, aggressive beef conversion has lots of negative effects. Also, you end up like fetching a bunch of instructions that are just going to be predicated off. And yeah, I'm, I'm very I, 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 ref I refer you to the execution talk. There is vastly more um, instruction level parallelism in perfectly ordinary general purpose code, not HPC code, just perfect. The mill is a general purpose machine. Um, there's far more there once you get the crap out of the way. And in order to do that, you have to have an architecture that permits it, and that's why, where we are. Okay. So you talked about two different mechanisms for uh, storing results for later loop executions, the belt and the scratch pad. It seems to me that when you're compiling, you have a choice sometimes between which of those mechanisms you use. Do you uh, have any guidelines for how you approach that? Do you use the belt as much as possible, or is there something in between? The mill is a statically scheduled exposed pipeline machine. The compiler knows exactly what is going to be happening in the hardware completely and unconditionally. There is nothing which is, um, in which the timing is unknown to the compiler. The hardware will, if necessary, stall to make sure that the guarantee happens to the compiler. And I refer you to our memory talk because the only place that can actually happen is on cache miss and how we handle that is in the memory talk. Um, but for purposes of just ordinary computation, the compiler has infinite knowledge. Consequently, it, the normal behavior is that the compiler will just simply, all results of any computation get dropped to the belt. If it's still on the belt and the compiler can knows whether it's still on the belt because the compiler knows what else is dropped on the belt, um, the, in order to be able to address the belt values, the, uh, those belt values will be used. The compiler also knows from live dead analysis whether that value is going to be used again in the future. Perfectly ordinary live dead analysis in the compiler. We have a dumb compiler. Well, we don't have a dumb compiler. It's LLVM that we're, we're in the process of porting to. And that's hardly a dumb compiler, but it's an or a conventional compiler, if I can put it that way. Um, if the value would have run off the end of the belt before its last use, the compiler simply inserts a spill operation at the appropriate point and down it goes. When the last use is coming up um, and, and, oh, well, it's not on the belt anymore, finally insert the fill operation, it's back up on the belt again. So um, it, it really works in many ways just like the way a register allocator works on a conventional compiler. Um, you put everything in the registers until you run out of registers and, and you've got more live values than you have registers. Fine, you spill something to memory. And when you need to use the thing, you load it back up from memory. The algorithm that does that is exactly the same for us, except that it's belt versus registers and scratch pad versus memory. Scratchpad is much cheaper to access than, than is uh, uh, memory and does not run the risk that the value may have been, uh, been um, kicked out of the, uh, the, the top level cache, which is uh, possible if you're using memory. And the belt has a number of advantages over a conventional register. The belt is, you, you cannot modify a value on the belt. Once it's bought there, it's constant. And so the belt can be thought of as being a static single assignment um, uh, uh, data set. And so uh, there's never a problem with, with uh, read after write or write, a, uh, write after write uh, hazards as there is using registers. As a result, the allocation and the usage is much, much simpler, um, the, and the analysis required to deal with hazards it has to be done on a, con on a conventional compiler when it's allocating things and maintaining lifetimes and registers. The, the, the so-called register coloring algorithms or the equivalent that, that is being used uh, is completely unnecessary in, uh, on a mill because you can't override the thing anyway. It's, it'll, th things just get pushed along, and all that matters is, is it's still here. Thank you. So um, 
I, the, I think a lot of the questions here are going to be variants of the form. Like, I remember when the quest for ILP felt like it stalled out in the early aughts, and so, you know, there's this sort of claim about ILP, and it's, you know, that, that we're all just idiots, and it's all out there, and we're going to get it. So um, I guess one, one way of asking that question is, you know, what's the biggest real code you've compiled for this system, and, you know, what are the, what real ILP do you achieve, right? I mean, um, if you can just sort of swing a dead cat to the Linux kernel and find some, you know, loop that searches a hash table or does some other horrible thing that doesn't seem very numeric and very scientific computy, and you're still getting great parallelism, I think that would do a lot to kind of uh, assuage the doubts here. So I'm just curious if you have any big codes that you can share any metrics on. Okay, I missed most of that, Dave. Big programs, big real programs. What's the biggest program we've compiled without having a compiler yet? Again? What is the biggest program we've compiled without having a compiler yet? Oh, that's real simple. I mean, um, we actually had a very, very pre awful prototype compiler running using the Edison Design Group front end and our own um, homegrown middle and back end. And we were able to get some trivial test cases through. But um, at that point, we re realized that we were going to have to do the guts of a middle end with all the optimization and everything else and decided this is not something we want to do and made the decision to uh, go to, at that point, unclear whether we were going to go to GCC or LLVM. And just as we had about decided we were going to go to LLVM, they changed the patent laws on us, and we wound up spending es essentially abandoning everything in that uh, in that work, and putting all of our limit very limited resources, starving startups, you know about, um, uh, into uh, getting our fifty odd patents started up, um, and uh, only. Basically, uh, only last year have we uh, gotten even vaguely at, uh, our head above uh, patent water. I am so thoroughly sick of patents, you wouldn't believe. Um, the provisionals covering some of this material went in uh, uh, just now because this is the first public disclosure, and this, we have to have everything filed before the public disclosures. And the uh, well, it's. Uh, it's been very stressful getting all of our new stuff uh, properly written up and filed. And as a result, um, the, the, while we have three people who are currently hard at work on the LLVM port, that is a long way from being ready to be actually doing a, a serious compile. That said, um, if you've done compilers and have uh, understand the architecture and understand the kind of code and the way it's intended to be addressed, it's fairly straightforward to see what the compilation process is going to give you. The very first compiler I ever did was for a ALGOL 60 variant called DC ALGOL on the Burroughs B6500 machine, which was a stack machine. Um, what was then would be called a mainframe. Uh, it, it, it might be roughly the equivalent of what would run in a thermostat today. But a, uh, that had one characteristic, that the machine itself, the instruction set and the program model almost directly mapped one-to-one -one with ALGOL 60 as a language. And consequently, you could look at a line of ALGOL 60 and go bum, 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 and just know immediately what the opcodes were that would come out of this thing. Um, I mean, you, you uh, expressions reverse Polish, one right, one right after another, uh, uh, perfect, perfectly, uh, perfectly natural and immediate. And it was a fast, very fast, one-pass compiler, almost no optimization at all, and near-perfect code. Why? Because the language matched the compiler, matched the architecture, and they were able to do that because it had been built as an ALGOL 60 machine. Well, our, unlike most machines that you get to use, which are built out of, pardon the expression, hardware engineers' wet dreams when uh, looking at gate counts, um, what actually happens is that, oh, the hardware engineers come up with these great ideas and great ideas and we'll save this and we'll remove this and you have to set that flag and, and in order to have something happen. And, oh yes, all the magic will happen in the compiler when we, when, at the end. 
Well, I've been on the tail end of, of those in which I'm given a hunk of hardware and say, compile into this, and I look at this and say, this is absolutely a hopeless target. I mean, you're just going to get crap code. It's just written, this is a machine designed for an assembly language writer. If you're writing an assembler, you can do wonderful things, and the compiler will never find it. That's not the mill. The mill was designed from the beginning to be a compiler target. That's why there's the inner operation and the leave operation. That's why there's the rotate operation. That's why the belt works the way it does. It is to make a compiler dirt simple. So yes, if you're familiar with the machine and you're familiar with the language and our targets are C and C++ and the other major languages and we've given, given some real head scratchers with people come in with languages that we're not familiar with and say how are you going to do this because the languages don't match our program model and uh, uh, had some folks coming in with, uh, with interest in Lisp and the fact that you can pass, or essentially you've got no signature at all at a, for a function calls and the hardware assumes that you've actually got an honest to God signature. Well, we had to work, you know, do some real head scratching and there'll be other cases like this. But for your conventional languages, your C, your C++, your, um, your Fortrans, even your COBOLs, because there's an amazing amount of code still in COBOL out there. Um, yeah, it, it, the mill maps the language. It doesn't map the gates. Some, it's not a risk in any stretch of, the, of imagination. A, a call operation is a very, very complex critter in hardware. To the compiler, bang, one, comp one operation, give it, it, it. The operation itself gets an argument list. You don't have to load registers. You don't have to, to uh, do, deal with branch and links and values that have left. Call, that's all it is. It directly maps. So consequently, we have reasonable confidence that we know what we'll get out of the compiler and we know what the compiler is required in order to get it. Oh boy, did that set people off. Go on. <laughs> I think we have time for like one more. Hi. Uh, I'm Jeff Bowman. I'm a Since I'm your manager, my intern, I, I guess I get to ask the question. <laughs> So uh, my question is whether uh, you guys are designing the mule to be a uniprocessor or a multiprocessor, multi-cores, and whether you guys are looking at uh, opportunities for combining ILP with thread-level parallelism and things like that. There will be a future talk on the subject of threading and multi-core. All that we have described so far um, it addresses only single-core issues. Um, we, have, we do know how we do multi-core, we do know how we do um, cache coherency. Um, uh, some of that is very lightly touched in the memory talk, but most of them is our magic term NYF, which stands for not yet filed. And we can't talk about it until the filing happens. Okay. Um, is there any plan to try to, ex to have the compiler express parallelism both in terms of thread level parallelism and instruction If level. LLVM will figure out how to do micro threads, we are, we are prepared to use it. So we, the, hardware, the hardware yeah. has, has this capability, and no, I cannot explain how it works because it's not filed. Okay. Um, but the, at this point, the problem is, is not really a mill issue. A, a micro thread from the, um, from the language through the compiler, even to recognize what constitutes a micro thread, is beyond the current state of the art of the compilers. And we're not going to extend it because that's something that everybody would like. And you could use micro threads on a conventional machine at some cost. Well, all that we yeah. provide, all that we provide, is the ability to do it very, very cheap. Yeah, but uh, I guess since you are designing a new processor from scratch, you could actually add some harder features, harder support to make it easier to extract more fine-grained threads with lower overheads and things like well, that. Well, actually, um, I suffer from a chronic disease called language designitis, 
once you get involved in language design, you, you never wind up giving it up. And I was involved in the revision of ALGOL 68. My name is in the ALGOL 68 report. I was on the team that won the ADA competition, the green team. And I've had my fingers in language designs over a variety of languages for a long time. And you know it's always tempting to go do it, do it some more. Um, we've, we have a few things where we think we probably are going to put extensions into LLVM when we get around to them that we have permitted, that we do know that we want to have. One of those has to do with dealing with integer overflow conditions. And this was talked about in the, um, the metadata talk. Um, and uh, we support for any uh, integer operation which can overflow four possible overflow behaviors. You can ignore it, which is what conventional machines do. That's just called modulo, because essentially you're doing modular arithmetic rather than, than bounded arithmetic. You can um, have a, a cause a NAR, which will ultimately cause an exception. You can saturate. Saturated arithmetic is common in the embedded world. We do support saturation. Or you can produce a double width result, which cannot overflow. These four possibilities exist for every operation on the mill that can, that, for which overflow is possible, add and multiply and all, anything else. However, how do you get at this behavior from your source language? Because C doesn't know about this. Well, the way, conventional way to do it, you use intrinsics. And you instead of saying plus, you say add saturated. Left parenthesis, blah, 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 right parenthesis, which the compiler recognizes an intrinsic and generates the appropriate thing. Well, if you're doing a lot of this code, first it's a, it's a classic invitation to bucks because you forget one to put plus instead. And the, uh, your code becomes impossible to read. It's a nightmare. It's nothing but intrinsics. You might as well write an assembly language. What we want to do is to add a um, type um, control, like volatile is a type control, called underscore saturating, so that you can declare a variable as underscore saturating int. And the computations with that will use the saturated arithmetic. To do this, we need also to declare a type lattice for the promotion rules. What happens if I add a, a saturating int to a non-saturating int? Well, what should happen? Well, th this is a type lattice. It's a promotion lattice, and uh, that will have to be done too. But if we wind up doing this addition, it, we'll put it in and it's as, as public as part of, the, uh, as part of uh, the LLVM. And we hope that people will actually use it and that if people think this is a good way to support saturating arithmetic as opposed to a, 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 a intrinsics, then perhaps the Language Standards Committee will adopt it. I've no great hope for this. I was on the standards committee that did the revision of 754 floating point um, that came out just a couple of years ago. And after having some experience with that committee and other committees, it's not clear to me that I will live long enough to see such additions, but at least we can put them forward and, and let, them, uh, let the community do with them what they will. Similarly, other things could be done for things like microthreads. Um, unfortunately, as I say, I can't talk about what we got. Okay, yeah, well, my point is uh, just that I think there's a lot of potential to extract more finer grain threads and uh, having a new architecture that is aware of this and try to, to expose uh, support for this would be very helpful. And, we try and be aware of what, what there is. There's an awful lot happening, and we're real busy, but we try and keep in touch. Yeah, you, you may want to take a look. There's some work I did like 10 years ago on a technique called decoupled software pipelining, which may, actually does I, software pipelining on multiple. May uh, I suggest that the proper place for those kinds of discussions, the mill on our website has got a forum. It's a very active forum, discussion yeah. issues about, uh, the, about this and about where things might go. A post there with links to appropriate places that you think should be looked at would be very welcome. You would get a response, and I encourage you to, to uh, participate. Okay. All right. Thanks, Ivan. Thanks, everybody. <coughs> we are... Uh... 
So I have a reservation for 10 people at Seoul, and we can squeeze in extras if anybody wants to keep keep the grilling going or do it over lunch. Uh, you're welcome to join us. Uh, 11.45, Seoul.